Welcome to class number three for futures trading for beginners. Hopefully you saw by the thumbnail, this is class number three. So if you want the best experience, then go back and listen to class number one and number two. We'll put the links down below. In this class, I'm gonna be digging deeper into how do you actually buy a futures contract? What are these margin requirements that I've maybe heard of? How much does it cost to buy our futures contract. And this is a little bit different from the stock market. So that's what I'm gonna get into here. So without further ado, let's just get right to it. All right, welcome to my desktop here. And let's hop right into it. We are looking at buying contracts and margin requirements, both very, very essential for a futures trader. So buying a futures contract, that's where everything starts, right? You gotta enter into a position and you enter into a position by buying the contract. Now, the contract, like we've learned, is valued in points, right? So in this situation, that image should look familiar, assuming you've done the first couple of classes. But as of right now, the contract is currently valued at 3,007 and 3 fourths points, or 0.75 points. Now, how much does it cost to buy one of these contracts? How much money is needed in your account? Now, if it were a stock and you know valued and just a currency, uh, because I am in the U.S., I always just my default is you know U.S. dollars. You know, it'd be very, very straightforward, right? It would be all right. Well, if it cost three thousand and seven dollars and seventy-five cents, and you want to buy one contract, well, that would equal three thousand and seven dollars and seventy-five cents, right? Very straightforward. Great news, though. Very good news in the world of futures. It costs way less, but. You know, good old economics 101 trade off. There's always a trade off. So the bad news here is it depends. Okay, well, it depends on what? Now, to answer this, we need to first understand a few more things. And the big first hurdle that we need to get up over and, you know, take firm, you know, understanding of is margin trading. So, what is margin trading? Maybe you've seen it out there. Maybe you've seen, you know, different brokers are always bragging about just different things in regards to margin. All right, so what exactly is margin? Well, at a very foundational, very simplistic uh, you know, viewpoint, all that happens is you make a deposit, right? And this is what you put into your account from your own pocket. So if you have $100 in your pocket and you put it into your account, that is your deposit. And then what happens is there's this little magic wand that happens and the magic wand within the world of financial markets is known as leverage. So this is what happens to your account your broker is gonna give you leverage, and they're gonna give you leverage to what? Well, to the deposit that you just made. So what is this magic wand? What is this leverage actually doing? Well, that is increasing your buying power, meaning how much money you now have available to trade with. And it is much more than what you originally put in, hence the magic part. So if you put in $100, you are gonna be able to actually trade and utilize much more than $100 which is a good thing, but it can also be a very dangerous thing if you're not wise and strategic about it. Margin trading though at the core, and kind of looking at it, like I said, keeping this at a very simplistic level, is essentially a loan being made to you like any bank would do. So if you've ever gotten a loan from a bank, or maybe you're thinking about getting a loan uh, in, in any shape or another, you know that's essentially what's going on here. The main difference though in futures trading being, it's not a bank that's giving you the loan, it is what's known as an online brokerage, which we'll be talking more and more about. There are though three main subsets of this loan that you need to understand, and that's gonna be the main focal point here because it plays a large role in understanding how you can operate and how you can conduct yourself as a trader. So we need to focus on each one of these and you're probably gonna hear the word it depends quite a bit because unfortunately, yeah, it depends. Like I said, that's the trade-off. The trade-off is you can get involved in these things for much less than other you know, situations such as a stock. But yeah, you know, it depends and there's a little bit more uh, things you have to pay attention to. But if I do my job right here, then uh, you know, you're gonna have a, a much better idea. So these are what is known as margin requirements. Maybe you've heard people talking, maybe you've seen the term online. I said, oh wow, such and such is great margin requirements. Okay, what, is that, what does that actually mean? Well, margin requirements, like I said, are broken down into those three areas. You have day trading, some people call it intraday margin. So a lot of these are kind of interchangeable. Some brokers will call it day trading, some will call it intraday. Uh, there may be some other terms for it, but you know, those are gonna be probably the two main ways people refer to it as. But you'll be, I'm gonna show you the process of identifying what they're talking about. That way, you, no matter what term they use, you're gonna know how to identify which category they're talking about. Then there's initial, some people call it overnight margin. And then this one's pretty standard, just maintenance margin. 
So day trading or intraday margin. If you wanna be a day trader, then this is the number that you wanna be focused on. You wanna be focused on that intraday margin. You wanna be focused, well of course, on the, if you wanna be a day trader, then if a broker calls it a day trading margin, that's pretty self-explanatory. But sometimes it'll be just intraday, but intraday and day trader are the same thing, and again, this is the number that is for you. But first, you're gonna to need to know this, all right, because this is very important, and you're gonna to have to use technology again as your friend. So you need to know what the contract trading hours are. Futures contracts essentially are open all the time, but not all the time. Almost all the time, but not all the time. So that's why you need to first understand, okay, well, what times are they actually open? So like I said, just whatever, uh, and all of them will trade at different hours, so that's why just throw in whatever uh, you know, symbol you're interested in potentially learning more about and potentially trading, and then you're gonna find out there. But for our example, we're gonna just continue on with the ES. Once again, assuming you've watched the first couple classes, you know that, that uh, this has been the example we've been carrying through and through. So if you do your research on there, you're gonna find that these are the current times. As always though, these times are subject to change. So that's why I'm all about showing you the process, teaching you the process, so that if these times do change, assuming you follow the process that's being taught to you, you're gonna be able to identify, oh, yeah, you know, that, that information in this presentation is outdated, but the process is not outdated because the process still led me to find what the actual time is. So again, my point here is not to focus on the times, but again, the process. So in this situation, we have CT, which means uh, central time, but I'm in the Eastern time zone in the world, so my mind just works better. So I'm gonna convert it over. So as far as when the trading starts for the ES, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Now if you are in Chicago, which is why it's based off Central Time, because the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, well then yeah, that would be 5 p.m., but like I said, I'm converting it over to Eastern time, and if you're another part in the world, then you'll just have to base off your time zone, you know, uh, figure what that is. But for Eastern, starts trading at 6 p.m. Eastern, end trading at 5 p.m. Eastern, and then there's daily trading halts from 4.15 to 4.30, which is kinda just letting everything calm down for a second, uh, but as you see there, it's only for 15 minutes and then things open right back up. But of course, you know, there is a, a, a closure over the weekend in the sense of, you know, on Saturdays and for, you know, Friday night. So, in order now for the day trading margin number to apply to you, this is a strategy you must use. So this is how you have to conduct yourself, right? At the beginning I said, you know, these are gonna dictate how you operate as a trader. Clay, what do you mean operate as a trader? Well, this right here, this is how you are going to have to operate if you want this day trading, this intraday margin number to apply to you. So here we have the trading session, and like we just learned, Sunday it opens at 6 p.m., and then there's that trading halt there uh, at 4.15 p.m. So let's just say that you buy at 8 p.m. or 8.17 p.m. Eastern on that Sunday. At the latest, 4.14 p.m. Eastern, you must hit the sell button. You've gotta hit the sell button, okay? So for the cool kid lingo, this would mean that you made a day trade. So again, in order for the day trading intraday margin number to apply to you, this is how it's gotta be. You've gotta sell. Now if you don't sell, because I could see that, well, Clay, what happens if I forget, or what happens if, we'll, we'll cover that in the next categories of margin here coming up, but if you wanna be a day trader, you know, if you want to have this number apply to you, and I realize we haven't gotten to the number yet, but like I said, the number's totally worthless if you don't know when the number applies to you or when it doesn't apply to you, so let's, that's why we're starting off with, well, well, when does it actually apply to you, and it applies to you if you're making a day trade, and this is how a day trade has gotta operate. Somewhere you've gotta sell before, uh, you know, the, the market's closed down. So Clay, how much does it cost? I just, I'm, I'm trying to be honest with you, so be prepared to feel like this once again, all right, because I don't want to build any false expectations, but yes, sorry, but it still depends, all right? It still depends. This is probably what you're saying right now. Oh, when I found that, it just made me laugh and it makes me laugh right now, because this is probably how you, just tell me! For, Tell me, all right, all right, calm down. The specific online futures broker you use will de determine the number, okay, which is the cost. So I, that's why I mean by, well, it still depends because, well, it's going to depend on what broker you're looking for and what broker you use because when it comes to the day trading, the intraday margin numbers, that's gonna be dependent on whatever broker you use. A little spoiler, for the next parts of margin, uh, it, it won't be this, uh, 
I don't want to use the word complicated, but it'll it'll be much more straightforward in that regard. But yes, when it comes to day trading and wanting to be a futures day trader and you know operate in a day trade type fashion like we just learned about, it's going to depend on what broker you actually use. Now you're in control, which is always a freeing part. Technology is your friend, so some ideas here to get you started. You know, running a search for best online futures broker, and then of course you know probably insert year right to keep it as relevant as possible. Futures, you know, futures broker day trade margin requirements. Uh, you know, that would be very helpful because you want to know not you want to know margin requirements, sure, but you know you can narrow always narrow it down because if you know you want to day trade, then throwing in that word right there can help you narrow things down a little bit. Um, so I'm not gonna sh I'm not gonna tell you the name of this broker that I found because once again, these things can always change. So, you know, I, I'm all for answering questions in the comment section, I'm all for answering questions, but say, hey Clay, what broker was that? If you follow the process, I'm sure you'll be able to find them, but that's what I wanna stay focused on is the process because I don't wanna sit here and say, use this broker because for all I know, five minutes after I release this video, this broker uh, either changes something or who knows what happens, and all of a sudden, this whole thing's irrelevant. That's why I wanna focus on the process. So don't ask me what broker this is. You, I'm sure you can find them if you follow the process or find, who knows, maybe find somebody that you find even better rates. But here's one I found, and let's now look at all these and all of this a lot closer. So let's get out our magnifying glass and take a closer look at all of this. So now that we found these numbers, we need one more number for additional context, all right? So I promise we're getting there. We're getting to the key number for day traders and how much does it cost to get a contract, but we still do need one more margin or one more number because you can't buy a futures contract without an account, right? Pretty commonsensical. You need an account in order to buy a futures contract. But you also can't open an account unless you have a certain amount of money. Or in jargon, you know, in trading jargon term, you know, an account minimum. Lots of brokers, well not lots, all brokers are gonna have some sort of account minimum, meaning, hey, if you want to open an account so that you can buy a futures contract, you need to first at least, at least start with this amount. So technology is our friend, and there's a, like I said, you can get creative, but if maybe you you're uh, you know you don't have tens of thousands of dollars or anything and you need to actually focus on you know I let, let's see if there's some a low account minimum futures brokers out there then that would be you know something you could start with is just a low account minimum futures broker and again don't ask which one this is but the one I found at the time that you know recording and doing research right there low minimum open your futures account with only four hundred dollars so that would be the minimum amount now. Given I am assuming that you're a beginner to futures, I mean, you are watching a, a, a class entitled, you know, Future for Beginners. Um, I'm gonna change up our example from the ES to an extremely risk-friendly contract type known as micros. And as of the recording of this video, I mean, they're not brand new, but they're still relatively new. Like, uh, within the past year, they are new. And, and they're, they're quite frankly very awesome. I'm gonna show this. So because of this, we are gonna be now focused on the MES. So we've been looking at the ES, but now let's look at the MES, the M just standing for micro. So we're looking at the micro ES, and you can see the name of the title or name of the product right there, the micro E-mini S&P 500 futures. So if you were to click on that right there, you would notice a beautiful, beautiful number right there at $1.25. So we're gonna go off topic real quick so that this all makes sense and uh, why I, I think it, it, it's very wise to start off with the micros. And warning real quick, if you're skipping around and you just showed up at class number three and you're watching this, these numbers may not make sense to you, but if they, if they don't make sense, then I'd encourage you to go back and watch class number two because that's where we went over you know, how these num numbers all work. But for context sake, let's say that Billy Bob has three contracts and he's willing to have a two point loss and he's got a $500 account. So he's got a $500 account, he's got three contracts, and he takes, let's just say, a two-point loss. So looking at this from a ES trade, so the up until this point, this has been the example we've been using over and over again, but that would be a 12.5 per tick. Once again, class two, you should know exactly what I mean by that. So that equates to a $300 loss, or in other words, 60% of his account gone by just, doing, by just having a two-point loss in the ES. 60% gone. But what about the micro ES? Well, that's $1.25 per tick, so that's a $30 loss, which means that's just 6% of his account. You know, what is the proper number? I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but the overall idea here I hope you're seeing is, oh wow, that's, that's a big difference. So micro, that, that's a great spot to start with all this because 
uh, you know, the, the risk can spin out of control. And remember, now that you're understanding what margin is in that magic wand, because of that magic wand, I mean, it can be very beneficial, of course, to the discipline, to the trader with a strategy, but to the trader that just shows up and is kind of running gung-ho and, you know, shooting from the hip and everything else, things can escalate quickly in a bad type of way. Uh, so that's why micro, much, much, uh, now, clearly you can still lose money, but it's, a, I think, a wiser way to go about it. Or as Warren Buffett said, you know, never test the depth of river with both the feet, right? Just dip your toe in the water. Maybe just dip half of your foot in the water. And, and the, micro, uh, the micros are a good way to do that. So continue to move on here and bringing, you know, getting back on topic here. Remember, because we're looking to day trade, the column that we care about is right there, intraday margin. So here's an example where this broker is not using day trading margin, they're using intraday margin. So again, just means day trade though. We're using MES as an example, right, as we talked about, so we wanna take a look at that row, and then how much is it to buy one contract? Well, for that, right there, we're looking at the column for intraday margin, we care about MES, and $50 is the cost to buy one contract. So we finally arrived, I appreciate your patience in waiting for me to get to that point, but I hope you also kinda see why I took us on a couple different detours first to build some context around this number here. But $50 for this broker, remember it can be different, there could be some brokers out there, maybe that's $100, maybe it's $70, maybe it's $40. So you'll, you'll just have to follow the process to figure out you know, what broker uh, you know, has something that you feel comfortable with, but for this one, $50 per contract. Now, these are very, very important, the two must-know numbers. Number one, how much did you deposit into your account? If you don't know that number, I'm gonna have to encourage you to improve on your business management skills because you know this, this is a business, right? I mean, you, you wanna tra you treat this seriously, and if you don't know how much you deposited, that would be an issue. But that's the first number you need to know, right? How much did you deposit into your account? And then number two is, all right, what is the at most loss, meaning, I'm willing to be a bit flexible in my trade, however, at most, I'm willing to lose, and then you're gonna you know, put in some sort of number. So very, very key numbers here. So how to use these numbers here? Again, context, remember we said that Billy Bob had $500, and he made uh, the $500 deposit. So the plan is this. He wants eight contracts of the MES, and at most, he's willing to take a 15-point loss, which is 60 ticks. So my question to you, is this a good plan? I mean, I hope you're saying, well, that's a good question, because it is a good question, right? We wanna make sure that we're not putting ourselves in any bad situations as a trader. So let's walk through these numbers. So the MES point is worth $5, and if he's willing to risk 15 points, that would equate to $75 loss per contract. And how many contracts did he say he was gonna have? Well, eight contracts. So that means, in total, he's looking at a potential $600 loss. Now the key thing here, and the, and, and the value is, this is all happening before anything ever happens. Now if you're running these numbers after you hop into a trade, once again, I have to encourage you to work on your discipline, work on your trade planning skills, uh, because you should not be running through these numbers before, or I, excuse me, after you get into a trade. This should all be done before. So I wanna make that very clear. These numbers, this little process here that we're walking through should definitely be done and considered before you get into a trade. So because this is all happening before the trade, he, Billy Bob says, all right, well that's a $600 loss. And that means he's gonna get a margin call. And what does a margin call look like? Right there. People knocking on your door with baseball bats ready to break your kneecaps. All right, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit in that point, but that's essentially what a margin call is, is your broker, because remember margin, what is margin? Margin is a loan, right? So somebody has loaned you money, and if you get a margin call, that means, uh, yeah, they want your money. How so? Well, let's think about this. Billy Bob put in $500, but he just took a loss, or he's risking taking a loss, remember, because he's doing this beforehand, so he's risking taking a loss at most of 600, which means he would owe his broker $100, right? He put in $500, now all of a sudden, he took a $600 loss, that means he's $100 in the hole, because of his own money, he only put in 500, but he just took a $600 loss. Yeah, knock, 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 uh, hand over the $100.
So let's keep on moving with this. Let's fix the problem, which, and I, I'm not trying to annoy, I guess I am trying to annoy you because I really want to drive this home, but this should all be done before any actual money is put into the market, right? Before the trade is made, you need to be ensuring that you're not setting yourself up to get a knock at the door and somebody's out there with a baseball bat. So really there's three choices here to fix the problem. When it comes to the deposit amount, well, Billy Bob could just deposit more money. Deposits the $100, everything's okay. Billy Bob could then decide, all right, well, I'm not gonna deposit any more money, so I can either do something with the number of contracts, as in reduce the number of contracts, or when it comes to how much am I willing to risk, right, the distance of the move. Again, distance of the move, if you watch class number two, that should make perfect sense. Or he can reduce the distance of the move. So looking at the numbers here, let's say that he says, you know what, I'm just gonna reduce the number of contracts. So look down there at the eight contracts and let's just say he says, you know what, let me just change that down to three contracts. So now all of a sudden, that's $225, right? $75 times three is $225 at most. So at that point, now, now whether or not, well geez Clay, that's still a, a big percentage of his account. Yeah, that, that's probably true, that's, uh, but that's not the point of this. The point is, just from a margin perspective, he would now be okay. He would not have anybody knocking on his door with a baseball bat. So he could have done it other ways. He could have said, I'd rather only risk 10 points or five points. So there's ways you can fix it you know, with the three choices, but in this situation, you know, he's just gonna raise it down to three contracts. So that is how it all works from a day trading standpoint. Just f focus on those numbers, and then when you narrow things down, at the end, it's all about the two numbers. What did you deposit, and then what's your at most loss? And that's how the day trading uh, you know, operation, that's how the day trading perspective is gonna work. But there is that other type of trading out there. So what about swing trading? Now, what exactly is a swing trade? Well, let's look at our timeline here. And as we've uh, discussed already, Friday 5 p.m., that is when the markets are closed. But let's say you're saying, you know what, I don't wanna sell. I do not wanna sell for the close. That, that's fine, that's possible. But at this point, this is when things shift and the numbers you need to focus on now are what is known as the initial margin and the maintenance margin. So this is where we now need to take a closer look. Now I kinda spoiled this a little bit because there is bad news but there's also some good news here. So the bad news is higher deposit amounts are gonna be required. So if you wanna be, if you want a swing trade, op, or excuse me, futures, and you want the option to be able to hold them overnight, the, again, totally possible, but you're gonna have to have a bigger account. You're gonna need to have more money that you can deposit into the account. This is though actually a good thing because it's gonna help protect from uncertainty, right? Because when markets are closed, and I'm just making this up, there could be some sort of world event that happens and all of a sudden that could cause things to get really, really crazy and because the markets are closed, I mean, th th there's nothing you can really do about it. So uh, it, it, it's, it's wise that they do this. Sure, it's kind of annoying because, oh, well, I, I need higher amounts, but it's actually designed to, and it's, I mean, to pr protect you but also to protect them, right? Because the broker's not trying to lose a bunch of money too because something, you know, your risk management is off. So remember, that's why all this exists because the broker who is in a for-profit business needs to protect themselves. So they are doing this, sure, to protect you, but, but at the end of the day, it's done to protect them also because they wanna turn a profit. But the good news is, is that the amount is the same for all brokers because this is all determined by the exchanges themselves. So right here, there's no research needed. It's not like, oh great, I gotta be a swing trader and I gotta start to you know, look at a bunch of different brokers. Uh, nope, none of that. All these numbers will be the same across the board. So let's go back here and like I said, because they're determined by the exchanges, in this situation, the decision maker for these numbers is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and this is going you know, all the way back to class number one there, but in this situation, that's who's making the decision about what these numbers are. Not the broker, like it is for the day trading, but for these, all about that exchange. So in this situation, because we're looking to do a swing trade, what we care about is the initial margin. We care about that column, and once again, we're still using the MES as our example. So in this situation, the initial margin right there at $660. Now, and I've, I've said this many times before, but remember, these numbers can always change, so focus on the process. Focus on the process and you'll be good to go whether you watch this video one hour after I release it, or one year after I release it, or 10 years after I release it, focus on the process. Now, initial margin. Let's go back to our example. Billy Bob had $500. 
So quiz question here. What is the minimum number Billy Bob must deposit into his account if he wants to swing trade? So if you can scroll back if you want, maybe you can figure out the answer there, but I'll just show you right here. That initial margin, that matters, $660. I'm not here to insult your intelligence, but $660 is more than $500. So in other words, Billy Bob, yeah, a $500 deposit is not gonna get the job done. If you wanna, now from a day trading perspective, as we just established, yeah, that, that would work. But from the swing trading perspective, sorry, Billy Bob, not gonna happen. So all right, Billy Bob realizes this. So let's say that Billy Bob says, all right, yeah, fine, and he makes a $1,500 deposit. So, so now could he make a swing trade? Go, going back to the quiz question? Hopefully you're saying, well, well, well yeah, because the initial margin is 660 for one contract, so if it costs $660 for one contract, but he has $1,500 in his, uh, his account, then yes, he can do a contract. Well done, yes, exactly. He can now do a swing trade if he chooses. So remember the, the trading session right there? Let's say that he buys five contracts. So is this possible? Is this possible? If you wanna pause and think about it, okay, here's a little before you pause if you're still listening. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of a trick question, kind of. Well, what we need to look at is what time is it occurring? So at what time is he buying the contracts? Well, he's buying the contracts when? Well, during the day trading hours, right? Because at this point in time, he would still have the choice to be able to sell before the markets close. So to buy five contracts, yeah, he absolutely could because that's only $250 required, remember? $50 in the day trading situation and he's buying five, so the math right there, $250 required. So let me really reiterate this. Yes, his intent is maybe to do a swing trade, but because he's buying during the day trading period, intraday, right, he's buying intraday, which is when you're always going to buy is intraday, that's where it's going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the $500. Your broker does not know your intent, right? Um, so your, your broker doesn't know that you're intending to do a swing trade, they're just looking at it as, okay, he's buying intraday, so therefore, we're gonna charge him the intraday amount, in this situation, $50. So let's kind of look at it like this. Let's say that he's thinking, you know what? I wanna buy five contracts, but I wanna keep three contracts past the close. So is this possible? Again, he's buying five during intraday, but he wants to, you know, he wants to keep three contracts past the close. So is this possible? If you wanna pause and maybe try to crunch the numbers or let me know, or we'll just keep on moving, but I think I've stalled long enough for you to pause the video. So let's keep on moving then. So well, let's go through it. What is the initial margin? Again, now this is where initial margin comes into play because he wants to hold past the close. Well, at $660 and he wants three contracts. So that's gonna equal $1,980. So he's got an account of $1,500 and you subtract the 1980, that would mean he's 480 in the hole. Not good. That would not be acceptable. His, uh, his broker would not appreciate that and they'd, they'd send out the goons. So all right, well, this is once again the margin call, right? Meaning you would need to deposit $480 into the account in order to make that happen. But, I mean, it's expensive to send out the goons, okay? Those baseball bats are high quality. I mean, that's labor. I mean, these guys are big and, I mean, they're just, woo! So that's expensive. So that means the brokers, they, they are gonna put a guard against this. They're gonna prevent this from happening. So how do they prevent this from happening? Well, there is, you know, and this isn't what it's called, this is kind of how I envision it, but there is this caution point. And the caution point happens 15 minutes before the close, and it's a situation where, hey, you know what? Do what you need to do as a trader. So in Billy Bob's case, figure out what you wanna do, because you, you only need, I mean, you must have two contracts by that point. Why two contracts? Well, going through the math, Two contracts times 660 equals 1320. And 1320 is less than the $1,500, which was his account size, right? Not trying to insult anyone's intelligence. I, I know there's kind of a lot of numbers. I'm just trying to keep them in track. But that's where the two contracts is coming from because at that point in view, hey, you know what? 1320 is less than 1500, so that would be okay. Now, if Billy Bob is, I, he forgets or he's trying to be goofy or I don't know what happens, there, this is what I, again, not, that's not an official term, but that's what I kind of look at at the liquidation zone. The broker will step in and be like, uh, no, Billy Bob, we are not gonna allow you to hold five contracts 
because that puts our risk way out of whack. We are not comfortable with that. We are a for-profit business. So no, Billy Bob, we will not allow that to happen. So they're gonna just sell three contracts anyways and bring it down to two. Why two? Well, because that would actually meet the margin requirements. So it's not like, well, what happens if I get stuck in traffic and I have bad reception on my phone and I can't? Things will be liquidated for you. So yes, I am being a little dramatic with the people knocking on your doors with baseball bats, but come on, drama is good every now and then, all right? It's, you gotta spice things up. So let's keep on moving. Billy Bob now has two contracts. So what is next? Well, the markets are closed as, in, you know, as, as we go through our example. So we now need to have a new focus. Markets are closed and the new focus, once again, we're sticking with ES, but now we're looking at the maintenance margin, which in this case is the $600. So how does maintenance margin works? Well, let's just recap things. At the start, you know, initially, hence initial margin, Billy Bob needed $1,320 to make the trade possible, right? During the next trading session, Billy Bob needs $1,200 to maintain the trade. Okay, where is $1,200 coming from? Well, he's got two contracts, right? And what did we just say was the maintenance margin amount? $600, so two contracts, he held after the close, each one of those now has a $600 maintenance margin, so two times $600, $1,200. And again, this is not anything official out there, but in my mind, this is what I like to look at as the maintenance margin scale. What is on that scale? What is you know balancing back and forth? Well, first off, how much did you deposit? And then what is your current loss? Or in trading jargon, kind of the open loss, uh, the unrealized position. So those are all kind of some trading terminologies that you may see floating around out there. But in this situation, we'll just call it the current open loss. So when things are in balance, hey, that's good. When the when this maintenance margin scale is in balance, perfect. When the maintenance margin scale is out of balance, that's where you get the knock on the door, all right? So $1,500, and let's just say that his current open trade is losing $250. What is his tipping point? $1,200, right? That's the margin scale that we've already determined. So that's his maintenance margin amount, $1,200. So question number one that you need to ask yourself. So walk yourself through these questions. What is the current deposit level? Well, he started with $1,500, right? That's what he deposited. But now he's lost $250. So what is the current deposit level? $1,250. So question number two. Is this more or less than the tipping point? Well, not to insult your intelligence once again, but 1250 is more than $1,200 and more means it is in balance. So everything is good, everything is good. Sure, he's got, he's taken a loss. Sure, it, you know, the position has gone $250 against him, but because his current deposit level is still more than the tipping point, everything is still in balance. For those of you being observant, maybe, wait, wait a second. Wait, I may, what's, what's, going, what's going on with these numbers? You're still listening. Well, at the start, he needed 1320 to make the trade. And yeah, 1250 is less than 1320. Uh, but it doesn't matter, okay? It does not matter. It does not matter. I'm not gonna yell at you like the rock here, but yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Why not? Well. I'll give you a chance if you wanna pause and kinda of just reflect, why doesn't this matter? Because we are now focused on the maintenance margin, not the initial margin. Maintenance margin, we've made the transition. Initial was just to get us before the close, before that liquidation zone, but now that we're past there, it's all about maintenance margin. So that is why the 1320 at this point no longer carries any relevancy. Um, it will again in a little bit, but as of right now, it means nothing. We don't, even, we don't need to pay attention to it anymore as of now. So we've established now that because that position has dropped 250 against him, now his deposit amount is only 1250. So let's say that that current open trade loses another $75. Let's go through the math. So he had 1250 and he just lost Got to subtract out another $75, which brings the amount now to 11.75. So quiz pre question here, is there a problem? Is there a problem here? Well, 11.75 is less than the $1,200 tipping point. So yes, yes, there, there is indeed a problem 
we have ourselves a margin call. And a margin call is essentially just the broker saying, hey, hey, you need to bring your account back into balance. So it's not necessarily somebody knocking on your door with a baseball bat with barbed wire wrapped around it. But you know, they're gonna, <clears throat> they're gonna reach out politely immediately and let you know, hey, hey, the tipping point, your account balance is out of whack. You need to bring it back into balance. How? Well, this is where we do now bring back in the initial margin. So up until this point, margin, initial margin didn't matter, but if you do exceed the tipping point, if things do get out of balance, then this is where you are gonna need to focus back on the initial. Now, full disclosure here, your broker is gonna track these numbers, they're gonna tell you exactly what sort of things need to be done, so it's not like they're gonna say, hey, give us more money, and that's all the email or the phone call is gonna say. They're gonna have the numbers because their computers and stuff are gonna generate all this for you, so they're gonna say, hey, you need to, and then they'll list out the exact numbers that are needed. Uh, but this is still important just from a general understanding of you know how this is actually working. So it's I'm not saying you need to set up some sort of spreadsheet where you need to tr you know I mean you uh, you of course need to know this stuff, but you know all this your your online broker is going to be having numbers and such that assist you out. So it's not like all this is strictly you with a paper pencil and a calculator. Uh, but like I said, from a, a general understanding, it's still smart to know all this stuff. But at this point, once again, because the margins maintenance scale has got has gotten out of balance, we need to now focus back on the initial margin, which is, as a reminder, that 1320. So there's now three choices that you can do this. So because the 1175 is less than the 1200 tipping point, your balance must be brought back to 1320. It's kind of goofy, I mean, I understand why they're doing it, you would think, well, why wouldn't you just bring it back to the maintenance margin of account? And I, I don't know, that's just kind of the way it is. That's how I thought when I first learned, like, wait, what? Why? I would think you'd have to bring the account value back to the maintenance margin account, but no, you have to bring it back to the initial margin amount, which in our example here is 1320. So you have three choices and three ways that you can that this can be accomplished. First, you can just simply deposit more money. Well, how much more money? Well, in this situation, right, you need 1320. So you still have the 1175 left. So that means you would need to deposit $145 more and then you would be good. No more margin call, everything is, everything is fine. You could, number two, just sell one contract. Because if you sold one contract, now only 660 would re be required. How is this? Well, think back to the initial margin. It was 660 per contract and now that you only have one contract remaining, well that gives you 660. So is that good enough or not? Well, what's our account balance? Well, our account balance is 1175. 1175, you know, is more than 660, so you would be good to go. And then the third way is just simply exit the trade. And in this situation, your account balance is now just simply 1175, which you could use for new trades. So those are the three situations, three different ways that you could, you know, uh, bring the scale, uh, bring the scale back into balance. But just to really reiterate, as soon as it gets out of balance, then all of a sudden, just like that, the initial margin number comes back into play, and you need to be focused on that. So certainly, a, a little goofy there. Not quite sure. I, I suppose I could research the history of why they do that, um, but. Uh, it, 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 it's just it's, it's something to clearly do with the risk and that's how it, it makes probably the most mathematical sense to, for the broker to, to balance and uh, you know, mitigate the risk because once again, they are a for-profit business and when they're loaning money, they would like to actually make money and they need to protect themselves. So that's all how you know, uh, that must work out for them. But overall, that is how margin works. That is how much it costs to buy a contract. Three types of subsets of margin, and depending on what you're looking to do, day trade or swing trade, that's gonna dictate what sort of numbers you need to be looking at. So let's go back to me at the desk. So you are all set. You know what margin requirements are. You know how to buy a futures contract. You know what it actually costs to buy a futures contract, and all of the above. Before I go, a final request on my part. If you found this course and this class helpful, hit that like button, leave me a comment down below, that really helps out. And if you know these things get enough likes and comments, then I'll, I'll do more videos like this and I'll put together out more free classes like this. But you know, it's just a matter of, is it even worth my time? But a good way to gauge if it's worth my time is to look at those likes, look at the comments, and you know, if people ultimately subscribe to the channel, that's also very beneficial. So like I said, if anything, 
Hit that like button, leave a comment down below, and hopefully subscribe to the channel. But at least those first two things really go a long way. So hopefully this helped you out. Hopefully you have a much better understanding of futures trading, and I'll see you back for the next class. First off, thanks so much for watching the entire video. Real quick, before you go, I wanna invite you to a live webinar, web class, training, workshop, online event, whatever you wanna call it, but it will be me live revealing to you what I discovered that has allowed me to transform myself from being an employee to being my own boss, including how I had only one losing day out of 73 days in total. I'm gonna to cover three keys that have helped me unlock profitable consistency within the markets. The first key is super weird, but in a productive type of way. The second key is super awesome because it quite literally is wired into our DNA as humans, making it very easy to use. But in a cruel way, this becomes a pitfall for many traders. I'll explain it all though, including how to avoid the pitfall that it creates for some. And yeah, the third key, when you hear it, sounds way too good, way too, good to be true, but it's not, and I'll show you how it all works. Then at the end, I open it up for a question and answer session that is, again, totally live. Even if you can't make the live session, please still sign up as it will be recorded, and you can go back and watch the replay that I will send you. Click the image on the screen or click the link down in the description box so you can get the date and time and claim your spot, which I should note is limited due to the fact that this truly is a live event. If you have any questions, let me know. If not, I'll be seeing you soon.